It's the Oatly Academy Artcast, episode 102, Creative Bravery, Why Animation Pros Sarah Marino and Jen Ely Thrive in a Challenging Industry. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Artcast by the Oatly Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, director of the Oatley Academy and your host. I was a character designer and visual development artist at Disney, and now I teach full-time and produce this show where I help you make a living from your own imagination. Find more art and story podcasts from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, kids' books, VFX, and comics at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. This month, Sarah Marino, color supervisor at Nickelodeon, Jen Ely, production designer for House Special, visual development artist for DreamWorks, and I are teaching a new online workshop called First Flight, how to create your new career in visual development. I invited them both to join me here on the Artcast to promote First Flight and talk about how they achieved such significant success in their animation careers. Episode highlights include turning fear into faith, becoming more professional by de-emotionalizing your creative process, why we stopped caring about job titles, how fear cost Jen a big opportunity, and why she'll never make that mistake again, why Sarah had to climb through a human hamster wheel, that's not a metaphor, inspiring gumball machines in the healing power of ice cream, and whether a successful animation career is really worth the cost. You can learn more about First Flight and enroll before July 14th at midnight Pacific time at oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash FF. That's oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash FF. start with uh, a little catching up. Jen, you were on the show fairly recently, not too long ago when we were promoting the Story Design Conference. But a lot has happened since then. And some of it you can talk about and some of it you can't talk about. So I will leave it to you <laughs> to to catch us up. Uh, what, what can you share to update the listeners about where you've been recently? Yeah, I have come off just a couple things. I actually just finished my first book, which was very cool. It was something I was uh, really excited to do and been kind of building up toward. It was a, a, awesome. an educational book for Scholastic. And then at the same time, I've been doing a lot of commercial work. We just did a commercial made almost entirely out of like felt and paper and fun materials for Travel Portland, which is trying to get tourism in Portland. I did that through House Special for Widen and Kennedy, which is an agency mm-hmm. also here in Portland. And um, that's a stop motion animation that just happened. I did production design for that. And then I've also been doing like development art for a TV show with DreamWorks TV or, you know, it's blended with NBC Universal now, I guess. Um, right. Yeah, but that recently sold to Netflix. I don't think that I can say what the show is. I don't think that's been announced, but Mm. I am now doing backgrounds for that. So it's kind of a little bit of everything. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, Sarah, of of the many things, many varied (laughs) uh, (laughs) projects and pursuits in your career, what can you talk about? I guess thinking back to my original two-part podcast, I am now the color supervisor on Shimmer and Shine, which is really exciting because Mm. I love working with a team Mm -hmm. and I also love being able to contribute vocally in a room, not just with my art. And I always saw myself doing less art, but still being around it. It's been a really awesome transition for me. And I have a really exciting new venue I'm exploring now where I'm doing a lot of writing. So for the past two years, my partner and I, he and I have really focused our energy on pitching shows and 
we called it the Hollywood hustle. We pitched everywhere. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we felt very LA in yeah. certain situations. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was an incredible learning experience and scary. And mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll talk more about it later mm-hmm. um, as we kind of dive into this podcast. But, you know, it's also rewarding where I can say I successfully am in development which is only, you know, lightning striking one time. It has to strike several times till you get a show. But I'm in development with one of the networks in L.A. and keeps me really busy. Don't have a lot of time. But I mean, baby Sarah, as I always say, would be super excited about what I'm working yeah. on. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, so. I want to do her proud. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh, so exciting. It's completely unsurprising to me, and yet very exciting, that you're both in charge of things now, which is, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> how do you think about your own work? How has your own sort of picture of yourself as an artist changed since you were in that phase of trying to break in or just kind of beginning to break in? I think I'm a lot less concerned with the title I have, I was so hungry for the art position when I didn't have it and the art title, so Mm. to speak, you know, especially when I started in production and I got to work with the artists and I was so hungry for it. I'm like, Oh, I just want to be a viz dev artist. I want to do this thing. And, you know, it kind of consumed how I kind of valued myself for a little bit there. And, you know, I had a really great support structure that Mm. didn't validate that feeling. But, you know, it's hard to kind of suppress something when you when you want something so badly and you're working hard for it and it's unattainable. And you're like, how am I going to get there? And it's, (laughs) you know, that whole spiral that we we find ourselves in constantly that on a day to day level, I just go into work and I'm friends with everyone I work with. I am excited to be a part of something that I get to contribute to. And I'm not really concerned so much with myself and the label I attribute to wow. myself. I guess I'm not really concerned about staying in that thing. It's being able to float between styles and projects is such a fun experience that I crave that more than a title at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really kind of the next phase of my career is just what else can I do? And despite all of this, it's all creative. Mm -hmm. So I'm still an artist. If I explain to people what I do, I just say I make art for a living Mm -hmm. because it's an all encompassing way to describe what I do. I think. How about you, Jen? How's your sense of self, your sense of your own artwork? How has that changed in moving from an artist who's kind of, struggling to break into someone who's not only working all the time uh, on numerous awesome projects, but also creating the overall look for an entire project and being in charge, having that sense of authority. What's funny is I, I feel like I've been thinking about that a lot because I think it has just dawned on me what a big shift it's been because it's been (laughs) like, it's happened quickly as much as to Mm. me, it feels like it's been so slow when I actually pull out of it. It's like, wow, this is all Mm -hmm. the change has happened so quickly that maybe I I hadn't noticed it till now. But I think the best way that I can describe it is to say that me as a person, and I don't know that I'll ever not be this way for better or for worse. My foot is slammed on the gas pedal. My foot is on the gas pedal and I am bolting forward and it used to be that someone in the back seat was yelling directions and I could partially hear them. And so I was going <laughs> forward at an alarming speed, but uh, hopefully I'm doing this right. And hopefully I don't slam into something and die. <laughs> but now, now it feels like I know where I'm going. I've been down roads like it. I've studied the Google Maps. I have a general sense of what's happening Mm. and I'm still bolting forward at that speed. There's Mm -hmm. a confidence and an assurance that we're going to get there and we're going to get there in one piece. And I was so concerned with what other people wanted for so long when I was younger. And I I think that uh, you can't not be because you are staring down the barrel of I've never been able to support myself. Yeah 
just off my artwork. How does that even work? How do mm-hmm. people do this? And it's so mysterious. But I think there was this focus on what other people wanted. And I think it really held me back. Uh, I tell this to students and people who ask questions, you know, what would I have wanted someone to say to me uh, when I was trying to do all this? And I think the hardest thing to do is take a step back and make the work that you love. And I think it's something that for me, that was almost impossible. And I think the more I thought about what other people wanted from me and tried to come up with what was successful based on this idea that I had, the worse off I was. (laughs) And as I got more work under my belt, and as I started to see some of the things that I wanted for so long happening, like having an art title and being able to pay my bills (laughs) based on art jobs, Mm. the more I was able to tune into what I like and what I don't like and making something that I'm proud of rather than chasing something that I imagine someone else would be happy with. That's such a great point, too, because I'm just going to chime in here because you're so concerned about the title and putting work out there that's going to get you hired. So you're trying to fit into this box. And I'm now in a point in my career and in my life where I'm actually being rewarded and sought out for what I bring Mm -hmm. to the table as opposed to what I can do to fit into that mold. It's such a shift to where I'm now creating the work that I always wanted to see. Yeah. And it shows. Yeah. Well, and I think it's something that is easy for me to talk about now, but I think. Right. (laughs) Well, even if I had had this exact knowledge to do that, it's so hard to even hear your own opinion, to even remember that you have one when you have someone that you respect standing next to you or you're surrounded by artists whose work, you know, they've been doing this for however long or whatever. And I think that's something that freaks me out. And I think as a creative person, you are letting so many things in. It's part of why you're an artist, right, is because you are emotionally connected to things and you have these responses to things. And to a certain degree, you're very open. And so these things wash into you, right? Uh, that, that's how I feel about it anyway. I can be very easily overwhelmed by too many ideas and too many thoughts. And I think often I would get my overall desire for what I wanted to do, you know, in a whole career and let it flood me in the middle of that job that day when really like those two things are separate things. I need to be able to push out that enormous pressure and enormous desire that I have Hmm. that at that point filled me with fear. Now it fills me with a little bit more confidence, but to be able to push that to the side and trust the things that I've always known, which is I've gotten here by taking an eye to my work and knowing the things that I know about design, knowing the things that I know about storytelling and applying them in a logical way in a set by step way, like, you know, the steps that it takes to make that piece good. And you have to shut all that other stuff down in order to hear it, in order to see it. Friends, when you're struggling to break in and it feels like nobody's recognizing your potential or the hard work that you've put in or that kind of thing, it does change. Your career does develop. You develop confidence and also the perception of you will continue to grow and and develop too. And, And there's just a lot of kind of hope and peace of mind, I think, to be found in that. I mean, I had a student ask me the other day, what kind of art I think is the good kind of art to make right now? More realistic (laughs) or stylish. And I thought, I thought like, I get it. I get where that question comes from because you are, you're just trying to figure out this mystical thing of like, how do I make a living? But it doesn't do yourself a service to ask Mm -hmm. that question. And what I said to him is, you know, this is hard. (laughs) Like as much as I love my job and I wouldn't want to do anything else, I sacrifice so much Mm. to do it. And it's a lot of struggle and it's a lot of, there's a bit of an emotional gauntlet to choosing Mm -hmm. something like this. It's so personal. And at least for me, it's been that way. And uh, I wouldn't make any other decision, but, but I do think if I wasn't making the kind of art that I want to make, if I wasn't at least some of the time making work that I was like, yeah, I love Mm -hmm. this. Like I would love this. If you're not scratching that itch. Yeah that balance tips and it's almost not worth it. Like what you have to go through to do this as a career, unless you're making things that you love, like that's the trade-off. Wow. Well, that brings us to the heart of today's discussion, or at least what I anticipate it will be. I noticed something recently. It's a common dynamic, a common conversation that I have with my students I mean, you know, there are obviously different versions. Everybody has their own experience. But at the foundation, it's this idea that it's hard to get started. 
it's hard to get started with, for example, taking your art seriously and really beginning to work your fundamentals and really start to develop your fundamental art skills in a way that is sort of uh, intentional in a way where you are driving toward a competitive professional skill level. It's also hard to get started when you're in kind of a familiar career rhythm. Maybe you're a graphic designer. Maybe you're, you have a non-art job and you're trying to now change gears and begin to pursue a career in visual development or a career as a, a full-time fantasy illustrator or whatever. That's hard, kind of starting a new career pursuit. Or what both of you have uh, worked through in multiple ways. I'm a vis dev artist and I want to do a children's book or, you know, I'm a work for hire artist and I want to become a supervisor. You know, any of these new pursuits are really difficult. And part of the reason they are so hard is because you haven't trained your brain yet <laughs> with a positive reward that comes from pushing through the pain, pushing through the uncertainty and feeling the win, right? Feeling the thrill of the victory on the other side. And so this dynamic that I've identified and been thinking a lot about and, and what I want to talk to you both about today is students who stop too soon, students who psych themselves out, students who begin this new pursuit, any of those that I listed or any of the creative pursuits like it, they begin that and then encounter that pain, encounter the uncertainty, encounter the failure, the, the numerous, any of the numerous failures that they will encounter in any new pursuit. And they go, oh, this confirms my worst fears. I knew it. I wasn't good enough. I didn't have what it takes. Oh, this is just too hard. When will it ever feel good, right? Is it always going to be this uncomfortable and this uncertain? And so I'd like to start by just asking you, what are your thoughts on embracing uncertainty? Both of you have embraced uncertainty and discomfort and, you know, yeah, sort of that awkwardness that comes with a new pursuit. Both of you have embraced that numerous times throughout your artistic growth and throughout your growth as professionals. What would you say to those students who made a choice to step into uncertainty, to pursue a new goal, and now are encountering that pain and are starting to worry, starting to psych themselves out, starting to be overcome with the fear because they haven't experienced that reward yet on the other side? I, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about a weird thing. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, going to be weird for a second. So uncertainty, I'm like a raw nerve as a person. Everything's emotional to me. I can be very hindered by uncertainty. I can be very hindered by just feelings of being a failure and, and there being a million people out there who are better than me and all of that. And, and that can bring me down instantly, just drop me completely. And something that I always refer back to, which is a very strange thing to be a heartening thing, is an interview that I read in some psychology magazine. I can't even remember at this point, but it was an interview with a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this guy was very accomplished. Uh, he was a doctor, but he also had tons of articles published just about scientific advances and things I don't understand enough to explain to you, but Given to say, in his field, he was very respected and, and had accomplished a lot of things, enough right. that they were interviewing him to talk to him about like, hey, how did you do these things that so many people want to do and don't accomplish? And he's very open about the fact that he's a sociopath. Now, I want to be clear, being a sociopath, meaning just that you do not experience emotions in the same way that we do. So things like uncertainty and guilt and, you know, that kind of stuff, he doesn't acknowledge feeling those things. Right. Hmm. But he doesn't understand how rejection is a swaying factor to people. So he doesn't set goals. He decides things. Hmm. If he was in our position, he would decide he's going to have his name in the credits of a movie. And that would be all it was. It wouldn't be a goal that he said. It would be he's just decided that. And so then he goes and looks at what the steps are for that. And then he tries to do that. And he talks about this process. He talks about applying to be published. Right. And he talks about how he's decided to do this. So he presents it and then it gets sent back. He doesn't spend any time going, oh, I'm a failure. I suck at this. Like, I'm never going to get this. He looks at it. He looks at the reason that it was rejected. He writes 15 more proposals with varying approaches and sends those in. Wow. And then if all of those come back, he does it again. Because what he understands about all of this is it's a gumball machine and he wants a white gumball. 
<laughs> and if he keeps putting quarters into that gumball machine, statistically, he's going to get a white gumball unless <laughs> there's something very strange going on with this particular gumball machine. Do you see what I mean? So he has acknowledged the fact that the number one determinant of success is grit, is stick to and the emotions that can hold us back from pursuing that until we get our goal do not deter him because he doesn't have that in him. And I found that inspiring because what I realized is if I can step over that, if I can break my own heart and hurt my own feelings enough <laughs> to ignore that shame, because to some point to linger on it is arrogance, right? To linger on that feeling, to let yourself wallow in it is saying that you can't acknowledge why you didn't get the thing that you wanted, whether it's because you're not there yet or because they weren't looking for your thing, whatever those factors are, you're putting all the onus on yourself. Hmm. And in a way that is attributing a level of control on yourself that is unfair and unrealistic Hmm. where you can just pull out of the problem and go, okay, like there are lots of factors here. Which ones can I control? How can I adjust this and throw it back against the wall? Because I can throw it back against the wall and eventually it will stick. And that's how I feel about it at this point is like, I give myself a minute to feel that feeling. Mm -hmm. And then I put that feeling away because Mm -hmm. it is not useful. There is nothing useful about that feeling. And it's important to acknowledge too, that we're not saying suddenly be unemotional. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say, you know, I've pitched over the past two years, over 40 times. Um, whether or not it was the same pitch, new pitches, whatever I've pitched 40 times, which to have one stick after 40 is actually pretty good odds. But you know, whenever you get that rejection letter, email call, whatever, I give myself a day. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what you were saying, Jen. I give myself a day to feel the things that I'm feeling. I give myself a day to be upset about it. I give myself a day to sit in my pajamas and play video games and turn off my brain and just kind of wallow because you have to process that rejection that you're feeling, whatever it is that you're feeling, you need to go through it all. Which is healthy. It is healthy to yes. process the stuff, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, of course, of course. I, I didn't you mean know, to. No, I, I oh, think yeah, what, yeah, we know. You, what you brought up was a fascinating mm-hmm. point where just if we remove the emotional connection that we have to something, it becomes easier to keep going. Mm-hmm. And so for me to do that, I give myself a day. Mm-hmm. And I've kind of been doing that my whole career where at first it was several days, several weeks in some cases, sometimes months. And as I've gotten older and I've learned to kind of self heal and Mm -hmm. self health myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) since self a lot, I've been able to process how to deal with rejection, how to Mm -hmm. deal with uncertainty by giving myself the time to understand that it's okay. It's kind of like the stages of grief. You know, Mm -hmm. you go through them all, whether you do it in a day or a couple hours or whatever, you then dust yourself off, you get up and you say, what's next? Yeah. And that's really where the balance comes in, right, Jen? And where we can learn from this doctor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think for me, it's the shame and the guilt that for me was something that I had to shut down. Cause I Mm -hmm. think disappointment is one thing and, and that is completely fair. I think at least for me, I would beat myself up in Mm -hmm. a way that was totally unfair. Yeah. You know, one rejection doesn't mean that you are not the good things that you are, that you are only the most negative thoughts that you've had about yourself. And I think a rejection can reduce you to all of those things very quickly you know, separating that disappointment from the total guilt, shame spiral, like you did something wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, and I think as an artist, you have to condition yourself to be able to handle rejection and critique. And I think that's something a lot of people struggle with, not just artists. Obviously, no one wants to hear bad things said about themselves, right? I mean, that's a difficult thing to deal with, but you have to learn to separate yourself from your work enough to step back and think about it objectively. So, you know, Chris, I would never have met you if I wasn't able to push through my fear Hmm. of approaching someone Hmm. new who Hmm. I looked up to and wanted to get their feedback on my work. Hmm. I never would have had that experience. So Hmm. for me, I also think of it from that perspective of what am I missing out on? Mm. And I get really angry 
if I have the opportunity and I don't take it. Yeah. So for example, I totally deal with anxiety and putting myself out there in situations that I'm not comfortable with. And working at Nickelodeon, I had a really unique opportunity to participate in an actual anniversary episode of Double Dare as a participant, oh, which is awesome. insane. I mean, baby Sarah <laughs> would have been freaking out. And so, you know, when I was asked to do this, the first thing that crossed my mind was like, you can't do that. What if you have a panic attack? Mm hmm. And then the other stupid things pop in. Oh, my God, you're going to be on TV. Like, are you going to look good? Are you are you going to see yourself? No, like it was all those th those. And this is not even about art, guys. This is about mm -hmm. being on Double Dare. Right. And this is uh, these are the th these are the thoughts going through my head. Right. <laughs> that serious business, though. Let's just take a moment. Oh, no. Like, right. Yeah, this is real deal stuff. But. <laughs> I had to sit there and be like, after having all these very self-conscious thoughts, I was like, well, how would I feel if I didn't do this? Mm -hmm. When am I ever going to have an opportunity to whip cream somebody in the face <laughs> and climb through a human hamster wheel? <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> so ultimately, I signed oh, up okay. to do it and... I can tell you, yes, I had anxiety about it, but I am so happy that I did it. I'm so happy I pushed myself out of yeah. my comfort zone and tried something new. Yeah. But this was a non-art related moment where I still had the same feelings, yeah. the same uncertainty. Well, what if people laugh at me? What if yeah. I mess up? What if I have a panic attack? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I do a bad job for the team? Like all those thoughts went through my head before I mm -hmm. said yes. And then I also had to sign a waiver in case I died. I wouldn't sue, but, um, <laughs> you know, but your, your brain is always trying to lock you in the handmaid's tail. Mm -hmm. like, oh, sure. like your brain's like, this could hurt you. So let's just, you know, let's put that cape on, let's put that bond, let's cover all of that because mm. it could go wrong and that would be bad. So mm. maybe let's just cloister ourselves. And, you know, there is a certain amount of that, that like freedom versus security thing. Right. And like, I think at some point you're always making that decision of how important is stability over new experiences, new discoveries, potential for new successes. And there's never a time when I say yes to something like that, even if I get rejected, that I regret it. Right. Absolutely. Like I'm never going, well, I wish I had never even, yeah. you know, I, I've never felt that even yeah. getting a rejection. It's like I learned something from it or I'm proud of myself that I actually like went through those steps. And I know that next time I do it, I'll be stronger having done it. Yeah. Well, and uh -huh. interesting you say this because the only regrets I have in my career are not doing things. Right. I think about this so much and it's JK Rowling, mm -hmm. my one true everything she <laughs> talking about how if you don't even do it, you fail by default. And that for me is how I try to operate mm. is if you don't even try, you fail by default. Yeah. How important is it to you to preserve the idea that because you never tried the possibility in dream form is still alive? Yeah. Like I feel wow. like sometimes people, they want to maintain the control over it. So not trying gives them the ability to continue to imagine that it might have happened and what that would be like, whereas trying it brings it into a reality place where they might not get it. And I think that's a really sad reason to not do something right. Like that's just a heartbreaking re because you want the fantasy to, to continue to be alive. That's just really, really sad. Um, I think. You know, there's another article uh, dovetailing with what you're saying about J.K. Rowling. Um, Gal Gadot almost gave up being an actress. She was ready to quit because she'd been trying for so long. And now she's Wonder Woman. You know, mm. <laughs> she's Wonder Woman, which is she's amazing. She's Wonder Woman. That's she's crazy. She's Wonder Woman. Yeah. Like, that, that is kind of incredible. You commit to that thing that you want. And it is a commitment. And the thing about it is, is like you always know the steps to take. Like the steps are typically pretty clear, right? You're making the work, you're putting it out, you're submitting to things, you're applying to things, you're trying to make contacts in that industry. All those things that you kind of know you need to do 
when you start talking yourself out of those things because you anticipate rejection, then you've already beaten yourself before anybody Mm -hmm. else needs to. And that's just heartbreaking. Like that's just a really sad, sad way to live, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for me, I still deal with all those feelings, but I think I care more now if I didn't do it, how I would feel. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of what inspires me and is the faith that I have, which is not to say I don't also have, and I mentioned this earlier, like a wonderful support structure that also believes in me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. They say your mom loves everything you do or like your parents or your family or whatever. And I think it's important to have those people on Mm -hmm. your side to get you through the moments when you're not feeling like you can. Mm -hmm. But for me, I know how much I would be upset with myself if I didn't try. And that is a huge motivator. And I think it's always been a huge motivator because I've also been upset with myself for not trying. So I felt how that feels (laughs) and I don't like it. And there was a time where I felt that way for months It was cyclical, right? I was down on myself for not working harder on my portfolio or networking or, but subsequently I didn't do it because I felt down on myself. So that like confidence wasn't there. And it was just this kind of catch 22 that I couldn't get out of. And I don't know, there wasn't a time where I just woke up one day and was like, I'm out of it. I've got the faith. You know, like yeah. it's not you, you'll you never have that. I think it just comes from slowly rebuilding yeah. when your walls are torn down and you're feeling so uncertain. You can't stay that way forever. You can't wallow forever, whether it's through the help of your friends, through yourself, through your family, all of the above going outside, spending time with your pet. Like, I don't know. It's the little things that aren't related to the goal that I think lay the foundation for feeling better. And then you can start rebuilding. And I think for me, that's how I initially got out of the post-school pre-career time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now that I'm transitioning into the next stages of my career, I'm a lot better and a lot smarter about rebuilding. Mm. I have a, uh, you just reminded me of a really embarrassing failure story that I think kind of (laughs) illustrates perfectly the times that I've been the most kind of disappointed in myself. I was an intern on the box trolls in 2012, and then they kept me on as a PA and I worked a couple desks over from Paula Sane's desk, who is somebody Mm -hmm. that I idolized and just one of my heroes. But he actually offered to throw me a color script image to work on. Mm. And I was so excited, but I was also so scared because Mm. they had never given me anything like that. Paul was the most intimidating person in the Mm. world. Like just, I couldn't have asked for somebody that I would be more scared to show a painting to. And I had never done anything like that. And I remember specifically, it was like a really complicated ballroom scene and stuff. And it just scared me to death. And little by little, time crept by and time crept by. And I was so afraid to do a bad job that I didn't touch it. Mm, Yeah. How sad is that? Mm. I ripped and clawed to get into that building. I was so excited. I was so revved up. And then this opportunity comes and I just let it float by and don't even acknowledge it because I'm so scared. That happened and I felt so much shame about it. And I beat myself about it so hard because it was just I mean, I look at it now and I'm still frustrated. It's like, man, what Mm -hmm. would it have been to do this painting and get feedback from Paul the Saint? Like, Mm -hmm. what an incredible, like, who gets that? And no, I I let the opportunity pass by. And I think, I think I learned a lot from it, Mm -hmm. but it's painful as all hell. You know, (laughs) it's like, oh God. And I I do think that after that, it was like, no, that's never going to happen again. I don't care how scared I am. I'm way more scared to just let it disappear and know what I lost. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Our friend Brian McDonald said, you have to love this enough to be bad at it. (laughs) And there's some wonderful freedom in just calling something bad. And I think we hesitate, right? We, We don't really want to just acknowledge that, you know what, I just made a bad sketch. 
It was just a bad drawing day. And there's just freedom in that, right? There's just freedom in going like, you know what? You're just going to make bad stuff sometimes. And that's okay. I don't know. I guess embracing bad can be really inspiring. I have talked to both of you about how I, uh, I'm getting the most creative fulfillment out of my plein air work these days. And something I love about plein air is going out with the knowledge that the painting I'm going to finish today probably will not be worthy of the Instagram feed, probably will not be worthy of putting in my online portfolio. And it's just about the process. Today is just about becoming a better artist. It's not about any kind of trophy, you know, this trophy painting that I want to go show. Now, that said, there is also the excitement of the possibility of surprise, the possibility that I am going to come away with a painting that I'm proud of and that I think is good and that I want to share. And that's great because that does still happen. But yeah, but I, I just think there's so much freedom and inspiration to be found in just being okay with the fact that something might be bad. And that can even work within a professional context, right? You're not necessarily always working in a context where you're comfortable showing your art director or your supervisor the bad stuff too, but, you know, kind of internally just embrace the bad and understand that bad is just part of the process of getting too good. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just think, I think that's great. We could really gain a lot from, from just embracing bad. I actually love that version of uncertainty. It's something that used to make me really nervous. And now it's something that I find exciting. And it's yeah. part of why I like making art. Uncertainty socially, uncertainty <laughs> like in like the career moves and like all of that kind of stuff sends me under my bed. I, I can't, <laughs> that kind of stuff. totally freaks me out. But uncertainty of like trying a weird thing that might be horrifically ugly is actually exciting to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is partly inherited from one of my art heroes. I, I talked about him in the last podcast, but Nelson Lowry over it at Leica. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he has this way of looking for the ugly, broken thing mm. and figuring out how to bring it somewhere that works, where it's somewhere right in between the ugliest thing you've ever seen and the most beautiful yeah. thing you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And that edge is so exciting to me. And I think that if I knew exactly how to make something beautiful every time, it would be because I had become a Photoshop filter mm. and I knew exactly which steps to take. And I'm excited by the fact that I might have to take kind of a meandering path to find this new thing. And that has become something that I look forward to and that thrills me. I'm almost addicted to it. Mm. And I'm glad to have that relationship with it now because it was not always that way. But yeah. No, I think that's a good point because one of the things, one of the processes I've been dealing with with writing is a lot of uncertainty. And I'm actually really excited about it because you go in with a plan and you have to be willing to fail at it and to rearrange it and to rework it. And I'm a huge fan of like post-it notes with uh, my partner and I when we're working on a script or a story idea and we kind of do the very writer thing and write our story beats on post-its and kind of put them mm -hmm. up and put them in the acts that they belong in on a whiteboard and then we're willing to just tear them off and see what else we can find and for me I'm so excited for development meetings after we turn something in because I can't wait to hear what they're gonna say wow and it's a completely different kind of uncertainty now. Mm. I'm no longer feeling the uncertainty like, oh, God, what are they going to say? But it's a, oh, my God, I can't wait to hear how they're going to make this better. I can't wait to hear the critique they're going to have because it's only going to make the story we're trying to tell that much better. And I think that's the type of uncertainty we need to embrace, the kind that leaves the possibility for improvement. More excited about the discovery then you are afraid of the potential for failure, right? Like excited about the unknown that Which, could be wonderful. Yeah. And so obviously uncertainty like with money or career, and we're talking things that like impact like your data, like your livelihood, obviously those uncertainty things are always going to be harder to deal with. So we're talking about here, just uncertainty in the making of the process of making and I think it's important to be able to power through different levels of it, you know, and for me, the finding of a new solution excites me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the possibility of a new idea, a new point of view. I'm the person where my partner has to be like, hey, maybe we shouldn't tell people this or show people this. And I'm like, no, but I want to know. Like, I want to know what they have to say because it's so exciting to not know. (laughs) And so, you know, I have to rein myself in to talking about it sometimes just because I'm so excited to hear the feedback. But I think that's a really great way to approach uncertainty when it applies to creative exploration. Yeah, and I think you can give in to the excitement of discovery when you have the faith that the steps that you have been successful with in the past will see you through, right? Almost every piece of art I work on is broken until it's not, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, like, every piece goes through the ugly stage until all of a yeah. sudden it's beautiful. And, yeah, and it's, it's that fake it till you make it thing. It's that yeah. like, you know, you know what you're trying to do and you'll know when you get there. And you know that if you keep applying these things that you know, these concrete steps forward that you know, you will get there. Fake it till you make it and 80% of life is just showing up. Those are two of my favorite phrases. I think they're both so true. If you keep showing up and you keep applying those things that you know, you are going to get somewhere good. You're going to get your white gumball. Yes, you can't you can't help it. You know, the only way that you completely shut down the possibility of that is by not going back. Well, and one of my favorite things, my mom had this printed and posted on our fridge for like the entirety of my childhood. And it was a thing about attitude and it's similar. It just made me think of what you were saying. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Wow. And I think that has really shaped how I approach most things. Mm. You know, life happens like things can get you down, but how do you choose to rise above that? How do you choose to move forward from it? And that really is going to define, you know, your journey and your exploration in the uncertain times is how you kind of process that 90% of your life that you have control over. I think a lot of it is learning what you want to like, I think there's a fear, at least there was for me when I was younger, like when I wasn't sure exactly what it was that I wanted, like I wanted so many things and they were so, um, kind of ambiguous and nebulous. And it was like, I didn't have clear edges or anything. and I didn't know exactly what I wanted. And something that I love about getting older is like, I've gotten to know myself so much better. Mm -hmm. And I also think that as a student, you have to give yourself a little bit of a break because you can think that you know what you want in a nebulous way, but until you get in there and do it, like that's probably going to change as you see what the jobs really are, as you Mm -hmm. like do them. Yeah. It's like you, Sarah, like you're, you're going into more writing and show creating kind of stuff. And you started more as a visual artist. Sometimes doing the work shows you the parts that you want and that's okay. You know, that kind of uncertainty is absolutely okay, and and you should give yourself a break with that. Going through those steps and going through those motions are the only ways to start even whittling down to like, okay, what is exciting about this to me? What parts of it do I want to pursue? And I don't know about you guys, but like for me, I feel like every year has been a little bit of a tightening of, okay, these are the things I'm excited about. These are the things I could Mm -hmm. use less of. Oh, yeah. And now it makes it really easy for me to, I mean, I say really easy. It makes it much clearer to me what decisions to make, what projects Mm -hmm. to do, which direction to go, because I know where the path ends and I see in front of me these decisions and and these things that I could do. As long as I stay on one where I still see a path to that thing, I'm happy. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I don't need to like, you know, change direction. And that's kind of what guides me at this point. And there's a comfort in that, but it took a really long time and a lot of experiences for me to build what that looks like. Yeah. That's good stuff. (laughs) You are two of my favorite human beings on this entire planet. And, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, self-reflection time this year and just, yeah, I've been taking some time to pull back and not work 80 hours a week and actually have evenings and weekends and time to paint and just kind of consider my my life in the next phase and where I want to go in my career and my work and uh, just in my personal life uh, lately. 
And a lot of that time has just been filled with gratitude. It's just moments of, of just kind of sitting in the gratitude. And, you know, something that I love about my professional relationship as well as my friendship with uh, both of you is that you so often articulate things that I am beginning to discover on an intuitive level. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel growth needing to happen in my character, you know, or in my kind of my life as an artist. And then the two of you put words to it, which kind of crystallizes it in my mind. It, it, you make things make sense. And, uh, <laughs> and I just am deeply grateful for that. And uh, yeah, just in all the ways and, and not just with art, but just in, in so many ways that I just think about life and people and community and, and all these things. So thank you as always for uh, carving out your Saturday morning to, um, to share some of your wisdom uh, with us here on the show. You're the best. I would only wake up for you this early. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, uh, as always, uh, for those who don't know already, please share your links wherever you would like to connect with people online. Um, I'm jenneely.com. So just J-E-N-N-E-L-Y.com. And then that has links to my Instagram and Twitter and those things. And I'm sarahmarino.com, S-A-R-A-H-M-A-R-I-N-O. And that's also my Twitter handle, my Tumblr, but my Instagram is Sarah K. Marino. So messes up my whole branding, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> In this episode, Jen and I talked about how the fear of failure cost each of us a big career opportunity. We both survived, but we regret the moment when we let fear keep us from taking positive action. What is a big fear you know you need to confront right now? Don't repeat our mistakes. Commit to taking action by sharing about it in the comments at OatleyAcademy.com forward slash go forward slash brave that's oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash brave and just a reminder time is running out to enroll in first flight go to oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash ff to learn more and register is a production of the Oatley Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, your host and producer. My assistant producers are Anya Marcos and Edua Evaneva. Kevin Chandler edited this episode. Anya Marcos and I wrote the copy. The music is by Storybook Steve and Kangaralian. Find more art and story podcasts designed to help you make a living from your own imagination at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. Mm -hmm.